Today I'm excited about what we get to be a part of. It is July 5th, and in case you were confused, yesterday was Independence Day. Anybody shoot some fireworks? Anybody stay up too late? Plan on coming to the 10 and made it to the 1130? You can confess, it's alright, we're not mad at you. We're glad you're here. Today I want to talk about freedom, and uh, specifically because it's July 5th. Falling on a Sunday, July 5th, we're like, what does freedom even mean at this point? Like we're in a place in our country where we're wrestling with what, what, our ideal, what our ideals are for this country and what we want America to be. We're wrestling with that as a culture, as a country, wrestling with idea, the idea of freedom. And so I want to have that conversation about freedom today. Um, and I want to do that because uh, we believe conversation matters. We believe at the brick that like you probably can point to a time in your life where you've sat down with somebody, had a conversation, and you were different when you left. They, you, you knew they cared about you, you had a relationship with them, you had a conversation, you realized something about yourself, something about your life, something about the future, and it changed you. And we believe that conversations matter. And so because my perspective of freedom, the title of today's message is what is freedom, spiritual and physical, my perspective as a pastor would be really heavily weighted on the spiritual. Like that's what, that's what I've given my life for, so that people can be spiritually set free, but that might leave a whole new category of freedom out, and that's the physical. What does it mean to be physically free? Because that matters too, that God's on the side of the oppressed. So if God's on the side of the oppressed, that's physical oppression. What does that mean for the church? What does that mean for us? So we're going to have that conversation. And I've got a couple of friends that are going to come up. And before they do, I want to introduce them. And I want to introduce them while they're not here so they don't have to like make them kind of have that awkward, like turn red because I'm saying nice things about them. Um, But I've got a couple of friends of mine by the name of James Popple and Joshua Knowles. Um, James is a police officer here in Muskogee. He is an investigator who is specifically uh, an investigator for child abuse cases uh, here in Muskogee, child neglect issues that come up. Uh, also, James uh, was, went overseas in the military. He was, uh, he's been in the military, joined the Army, and was hand-selected to be a personal security for General Petraeus. And if you know anything about General Petraeus, he is a four-star general who was the general over all of Iraq. All of the, uh, everything that took place in Iraq, he was the general over there in Iraq. So he's, he's kind of a big deal, right? So he's kind of, he was right there with General Petraeus. It's kind of cool. You know, anyways, so, and Joshua is a friend of mine. Uh, and Joshua did ministry in Kansas City for many years and felt God calling him to fight for freedom in a different way. And so Joshua is now at school at Oral Roberts University um, for social work. And he spent time doing some uh, internships through um, uh, sex trafficking and different things like that of that nature. So they both have a background to fight for freedom. And so I want to have a conversation about that and what that means. So if you could make a big, loud round of applause for James Popple and Joshua. No, let's give it up. All right, all right. As they're coming, I want to share these scriptures, the scripture with you while they're getting settled. The scriptures today, or the verse that we're going to talk about, the main theme is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. It says, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we're going to talk about freedom because if God's in it, there's freedom in it. So what does that mean, both spiritual and physical? So we're going to jump right in. Uh, I'm going to start, let James go first on this question. We're going to start broad and then narrow it down. So James, the first question is, what comes to mind when you hear the word freedom? So definitely no pressure going first. Um, (laughs) But so when I think of freedom, um, you know, I think of patriotism. I think of the red, white, and blue. I think of the American flag. I think of everything that it stands for. I think about um, our service members that served before me, our service members that served with me, and our service members that are serving after me. And so everything that I think about is what we fight for and fighting for the freedoms that we have today. That's good. Yeah. And uh, for me, uh, I still think of those red, white, and blue, and I haven't actually taken an active step to like think about what does freedom mean to me until we start having this conversation. It makes me think about how America is kind of founded on this idea of you fight for your freedom. And uh, like even when the nation was founded, it was fighting for freedom against Britain and just over our history, there's so many struggles that people faced in order to seek freedom. So I think it's kind of like our foundation of like, if there's something you care about, if you don't feel like you're living in full freedom, you do something about it. And so that's what I think of when I think of freedom. Yeah, you dump the tea into the, the sea yes. that you need to, to tell the Brits. Do hey, what you got to do. I saw a meme that said, uh, 
said, a happy treason day, colonials, reverencing <laughs> Britain. And then the response was, it's only treason if you lose. So I thought that was pretty That's good. True. So That's it true. only counts as treason if you lose. So, hey, now we're America. Take that, Britain. Anybody <laughs> from Britain that's watching? All right. Uh, so, so we're specifically talking about the difference between spiritual and physical. And as a pastor, uh, a spiritual to me is the most important. And I'm, I'm biased. So I would argue that even for Jesus, it's the same. Because what we saw when Jesus came is that there was a group of people, the Jews, the nation of Israel, who wanted to be free physically. And what they thought, the concept that existed for them was that there was the Roman Empire was in control of them. And they had a history that they looked back on and they saw David as their king and they saw Solomon as their king. And those were like the prime examples of what they wanted to be as a country. And so they were looking for this Messiah that was going to take them back to that time where David fought to set them free, Solomon uh, helped them prosper. That's the time they wanted. So they thought, well, the Messiah will bring that for us. Our physical freedom, we're going to get rid of the Roman Empire and we're going to have physical freedom back. And constantly, Jesus is redirecting them to something more. And finally, when he dies on the cross and raises again, it becomes evident to them that, no, 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 I want more for you than just physical freedom. Because I want for you a spiritual freedom where you're really free from your guilt, your, your shame, all of the things that you're carrying. That's more important. That's, that's the most important thing that you can have. And we see through church history people who are in physical chains and worshiping God with freedom. Right. We see like this massive amount. So... Uh, tell me what you guys think the difference is for you between spiritual freedom and physical freedom. Uh, for me, uh, like you said earlier, I've been, I spent years in doing ministry, and now I'm doing uh, ministry outside of the church with social work. And I definitely value and prioritize spiritual freedom, but I've, from years of just working with people, it seems like a lot of times it's harder to get to spiritual freedom when there's like a very physical limitation. And of course, like with the disciples, they uh, were in chains and all, and they're still able to experience spiritual freedom, but often they had that freedom before they were in chains. And so it's kind of easier to fathom. But for a lot of people that I've worked with, it's like, I want to hear about your God. I'd love to believe in eternity, but I don't know where I'm sleeping tonight or I don't know what tomorrow holds. And so it's like, it's kind of hard to think about eternity when you're right now is so uncertain. I think that it can be an obstacle to fully receive, uh, in order to receive that. It's like, I'm dealing with right now, though. Like, can we meet this need right now first? That's good. That, that's so good. Um, so for me, when I think about it, I think about spiritual and physical freedom, um, that they go really hand in hand. Um, and so, but what we're ultimately seeking is for that relationship with the Lord. And when we find that relationship with the Lord, it kind of opens our eyes. And we see things through a different light, a different lens. And we're able to be um, more aware, more loving, uh, just more understanding and be able to come from a place in love to have conversations that are difficult to have. That's good. Yeah, so, uh, so what we've kind of come to the conclusion in uh, this conversation and previously uh, is that spiritual is most important. And both of you guys, I think that that, that matters that you're communicating that because you're giving your lives for those physical freedoms. Um, but it being most important doesn't mean that it comes first in the order of things, right? What you were referencing is Jesus would feed them first before he gives them all the, the full truth of the gospel. Jesus would heal them first before he says, go and sin no more. So it may not come first in the order, but it doesn't change the fact that it might, it's most important. And yeah, absolutely. And I think what's important to realize is like our physical actions are still promoted from the spiritual freedom that we walk in. Um, I know for me, like even so for me, making this big life decision of like going from ministry or traditional ministry into social work, there was a moment where I legit felt like I was turning my back on Jesus. It's like, I'm not working at the church anymore. Do you love me? Like, ah, I'm abandoning the call of God. <laughs> but like after like so much prayer and just thinking about it, it's like, no, my actions will still communicate the love of God. Just because I'm not like being like, hold on, before you leave, let me stop and pray. Like it's one of those, I prayed for the person before I met them, I prayed for them afterwards. And like, it's like the Bible says of uh, Paul watered uh, the seed and Apollos planted and things like that. And it's like, we're all contributing to the spiritual freedom of this person. Just because I'm not the one sealing the deal with the salvation prayer doesn't mean I didn't contribute to them eventually getting there. So. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so... So you're saying if someone is passed out, don't talk about Jesus, then maybe give them CPR first. Yes, maybe exactly. Maybe physical, <laughs> say Jesus, say the name of Jesus before you die. How about let's start with CPR? Right, okay. exactly. All right, cool, cool. That's good to know. 
All right, so my next question is, give me a time uh, when you were most motivated or maybe a time in your life or continual times where you're most motivated to fight for freedom. Absolutely. So for me, um, you guys heard a little bit of my, my background. Um, I think back uh, to, and, and most of you guys can remember exactly where you were, uh, exactly what time it was when you heard that those planes crashed into the Trade Center. Uh, for me, that was so impactful, and I knew just then, like, I've got to make a difference, and I'm going to serve something greater, and I'm going to join the Army one day. Uh, and so 2005, I joined the Army Reserves. Uh, 2008, I got deployed to Iraq, uh, hand-selected to be a group of uh, young men and women to guard General Petraeus, who is a four-star general. He was the commanding general over Iraq. Um, and so just having that opportunity and that mission um, allowed to just open up my eyes and realize that there's a bigger picture here, and, and just the, the information and, and the knowledge that that general shared and knew and his leadership that he, he basically poured over into us, um, I was able to grow as a person, and I'm super thankful for that opportunity because it meant so much. But now I come back in, into the States, and I'm still serving because I'm in law enforcement. It's just another way to give back. Good. Yeah, and I love that because it, it kind of speaks to the first time where, or at least for me, it resonates with the first time I learned about freedom for other people. Like, I know what my life looks like. I feel comfortable uh, growing up in America. But for me, the first time I was motivated to fight for freedom would be uh, when I was in high school and heard about Joseph Coney and his child army. Um, and it's like, oh, my gosh. And there's an organization called Invisible Children. And we would do 5Ks and fundraising, things like that, all to bring an end to it. And what I love about what you're saying is, like, that might be the first step. Like when 9-11 happened, you're like, okay, I'm going to do this. And for me, it's like, okay, I'm going to do this. But now, um, for me, it's like that same burn and that zeal to create freedom in the lives of others is still present. It just looks different. And so like for me, uh, yesterday I was reading What to a Slave is the Fourth of July by Frederick Douglass. And that is a powerful speech and kind of galvanized me to recognize like, hey, the the fight for equality, uh, the righteousness that God desires, that like right relationship between fellow man, like God talks about in Amos 5, 24, like he expects that and we're not there yet. And to read Frederick Douglass's words and realize that he's calling out the church and he's calling out America from a place of love and respect of like, we're not here yet. This is what it looks like. And these are the things we say we believe in. We believe in uh, all men are created equal in the pursuit of happiness. And as Christians, we believe that God created man and woman and of all colors to be respected. And it's one of those, like, it's so challenging to read that. And it just ignited that in me again of, like, we need to have more conversations like these so that people don't have an excuse to turn the other way. Like, I think one of the harshest things that he said that was really, like, stirring to me, he said, a worship that doesn't feed the hungry but only has services, uh, a worship that doesn't uh, care for the orphan, but gives a lot of money. They're, that is a curse to mankind rather than a blessing. And it's one of those like, whoa, like we are, if we as the church are supposed to be the gateway to the hope of the world, and that's what God expects of us to do, and we're not doing it, of course we're a curse rather than a blessing. It just, it stirs me. And so like right now, more than ever, I'm feeling this like, we have to fight for freedom because that's what God expects of us. Yeah, that's good. I, it's interesting that the avenues you can go down as you're talking about that aspect of fighting for freedom and how powerful those words are during slavery. Then they're celebrating the 4th of July and freedom. And he's writing and saying this in the midst of slavery and as a black man in the midst of slavery saying that. It's interesting the, how quickly we can go one of two routes where we either are so overwhelmed by it where it's like, I don't even know what to do, so I just ignore it almost. Or we're, we don't experience it ourselves, so we, we can kind of make excuses for why it doesn't exist, right? And, and uh, T.D. Jakes talks about this moment in history where he, he visited a church while right down, right on the, like, at the bottom of the hill of the church was where slavery was basically instigated and where people were losing their lives. And so you had this, the church bells ringing simultaneously while slavery was existing and you can like kind of close your eyes to what's going on around you and just stay comfortable right. in where you're at and how, how, how easy it is to do it in every area of our life, right? Any, not just in the aspect of freedom, how quickly we can get there and how much we're called to stay in that moment and really ask enough questions and have these conversations where we're talking and saying, what does it look like for you? Well, what does it look like for you? And be honest about 
our journey and what it means to us so that we can come together as a church and fight for something that matters. So, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so my question as we're talking about fighting for freedom is, is there another country or another time period that has your ideal version of freedom? Uh, not that I have seen. Um, it's, it's, no, I haven't seen one. I will say, uh, right now is probably like the next best thing. And maybe, and like, I mean, we re- if we read the Bible, we'll see like in the future when Jesus comes back, like we do have that freedom, physical and spiritual, and like a complete freedom. Um, but he's not here yet. So this is a great second, I guess. Yeah. Um, and it's, and we've definitely made strides. Like Frederick Douglass said all that he said in 1856, and which blows my mind is he quoted another dude from 1800. He's like, hey, slavery is bad. Don't do it. It is like literally within the first 30 years of America. And so like we've clearly made leaps and bounds, which is awesome. And I celebrate that and recognize it. But it's one of those like, just because we've, you know, like if you have a checklist, just because you did the first two things doesn't mean the checklist is done. Congratulations. Let's pat ourselves on the back, but let's not stop. I've been doing checklists wrong this whole time. <laughs> I just tried to get one or two done and felt good about myself. My bad. <laughs> Got to reset. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, the U.S. is the greatest country that there is out there. You know, that's, that's why I went and, and joined, and, and that's why I fought for our, our country. Uh, there's not a better one out there. We are going through a trying time as a nation right now. Um, things are difficult, but what I know about us as Americans is – we're dreamers. We're innovative. We are constantly striving for something better. Um, we want that better environment for our loved ones, for our family and generations after us. That's what we want. We want, we want better for people. Yeah. And so um, that's, that's really the goal is just to continue to grow. Um, so I don't think that there's uh, any better country. I, and I think that we're in a tough spot, but we are going to continue to grow. Um, something that I say at the police department is, is uh, you got to be you got to get comfortable in being uncomfortable. And some, some of these conversations that we're going to have and during this time period and this struggle uh, is, is where the growth is going to come from, is where we're uncomfortable and getting out of our comfort zone because that's where that growth is going to happen. That's good. Yeah, I, so one of the reasons I asked this question, and I don't know that anybody would say yes to that question, so it's almost like an easy one. Like we're all probably going to say no, that there's not another time period, there's not another country that's going to have the ideal version. I think it's important that we remind ourselves of that because that where you fight from knowing that what I'm fighting for doesn't exist is different, right? If I'm, if I'm the church or I'm the country and I'm looking and seeing another country doing it, doing what I want, or another church doing what I want to have, then I'll just go ask them and duplicate what they're doing, right? It's like, that works, I'm going to do what they're doing. Or, hey, that's the rules and laws we should have in place, so I'm going to go do that. But we're fighting for something that doesn't yet exist. Like, we're... We're fighting for a dream that doesn't yet exist, right? Even when the the Declaration of Independence is written, the dream was written down. All men are created equal. And it's like, well, that should be so simple. It should be be very clear to everybody in the room. That's done. We we fixed it. We figured it out. We're all created equal. And yet slavery still exists. And the guys writing them had slaves. And they're signing it while they had slaves. So there's this weird kind of cognitive dissonance where we have two beliefs that exist but don't meet up to, to one another and recognize like something's about what we believe is wrong. And so they got to this place where they're arguing about, well, how much, and like, do women count as men? Like, or is, or is this mankind as a whole when we say men? And they're like, no, they don't get to vote. Just let them take care of the kids. Do the kids count? No, they're property. And then we go <laughs> on to like have a conversation about the black men that are slaves. Do they count? And then they, they, they come to this compromise in like 1885 to say men the, the black men slaves are now three-fifths of the population. They count as three-fifths of a vote. They count as three-fifths as we count as a full person. It's like, didn't we write all men? Did somebody write an asterisk on that? We were supposed to look at the notes right. at the bottom that said, well, not all men. We said all men. No, but it's interesting that we had an ideal when we wrote it, and we haven't been able to live up to it. And, and I think that it's important to know that there's something we're, we're fighting for from a place of it hasn't happened yet. And the analogy I would use is, is the Wright brothers trying to fly, right? They're, they're not looking and saying, well, dude, they, they, you know, over in Japan, they learned how to fly. Why can't we do it? They're looking saying, we're innovating the first time to do this. And I think as a country, we're innovating the first time to figure out how to actually have all men created equal. How do we do that? We don't know. We haven't seen it done. 
So I'm not fighting from a place of like, this is so dumb, it's so simple, let's just do these three things and it'll be fixed. I'm fighting from a place of, I don't know, let's try these three things and see if they work. Let's be that innovator that you were talking about. Let's innovate and figure out how to get there because it's never been done before. This is new. And yeah, there's tension. And the best thing that can happen is growth in that tension so that we can get to a place that's a dream, a dream that doesn't exist anywhere in the world, any time period. We're going to get there, but it's going to take some uncomfortable times to get there. Yeah. Absolutely. So there's something that's really important to note is, you know, there's different ways to fight for your freedom. Uh, I went overseas to fight for our freedom, uh, but there's, we're still doing it here in the States. And, and there is different ways, and everybody has a role in fighting for that freedom and changing our, our ideal version of freedom. Yeah, that's good. And what I love about that is, like, even Jesus did that. Um, I like, we're all three men of service, and we all serve in different environments, and that's still creating freedom for individuals and our communities. But I also love... Um, I feel like freedom of choice is something worth talking about as well, because I feel like in this climate right now, we think like in order to achieve said goal or in order to please God, we have to do this or we have to do that. And I feel like a lot of the voices that we're hearing right now kind of minimize our freedom of choice of making it choose between the two. But it makes me think of uh, the woman that was caught in adultery and this woman's thrown in front of Jesus and the Pharisees are like, hey, Jesus, she sins, she deserves a rock to the face. And Jesus was being in that pressured situation of like, I either stone her or I excuse her. And if I excuse her, therefore I'm denying what the Bible says. But then he comes up with this brand new option, because again, he's creative and he's innovative because this hadn't been done yet before. And he just doodles in the sand. And even now we don't know what, it, what he was writing, but it led to the result of the Pharisees walking away and for him to have this very genuine moment with this young lady. And I feel like that's where we're at right now in the sense of Absolutely. we are thinking we have to either do this or we have to do that. But if we seek God, if we humble ourselves enough to seek God, will we listen to be like, hey, here's this option you haven't considered yet. You wouldn't have thought of it on your own. It wouldn't create the solution that you really wanted, but we need to pause and allow him to lead us because we're Christians. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah, yeah. So my next question is what steps should we take to get to the ideal version of freedom? So for me, I think the next steps that we need to take is we need to be, uh, we need to come from a place of not anger. We need to come from a place of, of trust or from a solid ground. If you think about it in the context of if you've ever argued with somebody or ever been mad at somebody, it's difficult to come to a solution in that point of anger. And that's kind of what we're doing right now uh, in our nation is a lot of times we're, we're facing things with anger. We need to face things with love and and just with that, that lens through the Lord of, of making a better outcome for everybody. And so I think that's where we need to go. We need, we need to find that common ground, have those conversations that are need to have so that we can move forward from here. That's good. All right, and I think that's so vital because the truth of the matter is when you're talking to somebody about something you're passionate about or you care deeply about and they disagree with you, anger is our natural human response. Oh, yeah. But that's not what God asked us to do. And so it's like, it's for me to hear someone's alternative perspective and empathize with them. Like, okay, what brought them to this conclusion? What, what similarities do we have? And like, it says that in Second Timothy of the whole, like, have conversations well. And that will lead to change. And then it also says that we trust God to create that change. It's not on me to change someone's opinion just because I think I'm right and that they're wrong. It's my responsibility to love that person as a brother and a sister and allow that to create the change that we need. And then after that, we're expected, to, we're expected to move forward from that. And I think it's a continual, we have to pray and we have to seek God in order to stay in this place of humility. It says in Proverbs to guard our heart. And I feel like complicity has this sneaky way of just sneaking in there and just be like, hey, you've done a lot. You're good. Like you read, you listened to a podcast, you read a book, you're good. You have achieved maturity. You don't need to grow anymore you're good. And I feel like that's the temptation we all feel. But again, God calls us to hire. So we have to continually set that out. Yeah. Yeah. There, there is this shooting for an ideal uh, and, and knowing that you're not there is, is complicated. And sometimes we label it or we perceive it as hypocrisy because as the church, we get, we, we, we get a lot of a lot of kind of, well, there's a bunch of hypocrites at the church. And like my state, or the statement I've heard that I, I use all the time is, well, like, yeah, we do have a lot of hypocrites and there's plenty of extra room for more. So come on and join us, you know? So like, 
there, there is this idea that it, I don't think it's hypocrisy if we're honest and humble about the reality that we're striving for a perfection that we haven't reached. We want to look like Jesus, but we don't look like Jesus all the time. So come join us in this fight for something that we haven't yet attained, and, and we never really get there. Until eternity, we're not going to be perfect. And so if you're looking for a perfect pastor, I don't, there's not one in town, but there's definitely not one here. Okay, If you're looking for one without mistakes, if you want a list of my mistakes, I can give them to you. I've got a list. You can talk to my wife. She can give them to you. Even my daughter, who's five, could probably give you some of my, some of my errors. There's an ideal that we're looking at and saying we're fighting for something that we haven't yet achieved, and that's okay, as long as we're humble enough to say that we haven't achieved it. When we say we've arrived, then that's a problem, and that becomes hypocrisy. And Yeah, I feel like you said it very well. Like That's the difference between hypocrisy and humility, yeah. Reco- and being willing to admit, I have not arrived yet. Because I feel like that's what annoys people. If you're like, oh, no, I'm saved, therefore I am perfect. Like That annoys everybody. <laughs> but if you're like, I'm saved, and I'm progressing towards Christ, like, oh, okay, tell me about this journey. Like, I feel like, because we're all on a journey towards something, and I feel like if you say, like, you're perfect or you're a hypocrite, you're saying, I finished, which is like, no, that doesn't make any sense. So, again, I think that's the difference between humility and hypocrisy is admitting, being willing to admit, I still have some work to do. Yeah, that's good. So being uncomfortable in the, or being comfortable in the uncomfortable. That's right. Okay, so my last question is, uh, James, what is the church's role in creating freedom? So... The church's role in creating freedom for me is this is a, an amazing place that brings everybody. It doesn't matter your race, religion, uh, your political beliefs. It brings everybody unified under one roof for one common goal. And, and that's what we're doing. Uh, that's what the church, church does. It spreads love. And that's what's going to get us forward. Um, that's what's going to get us through this is that love, that communication, and being able to see things through that lens um, and just Come, t- come together. That's what church does. It unifies us. Yeah, it's good. All right. And um, I, I agree. And I feel like it goes back to that we all have different roles. Um, and I see it as the body of Christ that Paul writes about of like, uh, it'd be like my hand, for example. Um, I would see like the fingers being us as individuals and the body of Christ being the palm like brings us together. Like even on the stage right now, we have a police officer, a pastor, a social worker, and then put yourself here like, do you, you're the mother of your home and you're making sure your kids don't die because they choked on a Lego or something. I don't know. I don't have kids, so I don't know what that struggle is. <laughs> um, but then like, are you in sales? Like, and then you, we all come together to create the job that needs to be done. And then of course your hand can do a lot of things the same way that we need to be able to do a lot of things. It's just like, we, I feel like the church is like the headquarters, the very physical headquarters to create that spiritual trajectory that we need to get to. Yeah, that's Absolutely. good. Absolutely. That's good. And I was reminded specifically during this talk, because we didn't talk about it previous to this, you, you mentioned Fre- Frederick Douglass, and you mentioned people that are called to specific areas, and how much, if one of those fingers is missing, how much it hurts the body of Christ. And I, I feel like in our, in our nation right now, there is somebody out there that is specifically the racial divide. There is somebody out there that is rejecting the call to step in the gap to where where I there may be somebody in between this that I don't I don't recognize. But like where Martin Luther King left off, that somebody that unifies with a vision of hope and a vision of peace that unifies us in that same way. I feel like there's somebody that's a that's a finger that doesn't want to acknowledge that they're the finger that they're called to be. Yeah. And so. Well, the reason I'm saying that is wherever you're at, whether you're the mom, whether you're the salesperson, whether you're a pastor, whatever your calling is, be comfortable in the uncomfortable. Absolutely. Like James said, you got, you have to be comfortable in the uncomfortable. Step into your call because we're hurting because you're not. We're yeah. hurting as a church yeah. and we're missing something. It may not be the person that you're called to, to, to unite the, the church. But something's hurting. It may be in kids' ministry that's hurting. It may be that lost kid that doesn't get saved because we don't have the right person, the right person in that spot to be in the right there for that person. It could be that person that's addicted to drugs and they don't have your story of drug addiction and how you can help them out. It hurts the body of Christ when you're not where you're called to be. So. If I can add what, like, Come on. let's pause, acknowledge that, like, because this is an add-on. Like, if this, <laughs> what I'm going to say is not going to make sense if you don't, like, <laughs> register that. Um... It, go, it goes back to the innovation because I feel like me personally, and if it hits you, it hits you, but chances are, like me personally, I will do the compare thing. Mm-hmm. Like for me, the reason I felt I had such a challenge stepping into social work and away from ministry is because people I've seen successfully do things for God only did it in the ministry 
line yeah. of work. And so I thought not doing ministry would be not doing the will of God. But that's not what he's called me to do. And so, like, again, if we look at our fingers, they're all different heights. But that's because they're all for different purposes. Like, my thumb might seem the shortest right now, but, like, me holding, the, like, this would drop. I would be concerned, and then I have to buy a new mic for the brick. Like, it's, so we're all different heights for different reasons. So do not be so fixated on what's on Instagram or whatever else or what Tabitha Brown's doing with her cooking. Like, I can't cook. Like, <laughs> let's recognize for a second she's gifted. I'm not. What is my gift in? Let me run in that direction. And so it's just like, please be you because that's what we as the church are waiting for. That's good. That, that's what makes us so unique is everybody brings something different to the table. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that's good. All right, can we give it up for these guys sharing their time? So something that we talked about as we conclude is how important the spiritual freedom is and that both of these guys now are fighting from a place of spiritual freedom so the physical freedom can happen. And I think we're all called to fight for that. The question is, have you, have you met the person that sets you free spiritually? Have you met the person that let you know, hey, look, uh, I, your sins are forgiven and I love you and created you the way you are, but I loved you too much to leave you there. I, I love you and I've set you free from your guilt and your shame. All you have to do is choose to follow me. And if you haven't, I want you to be free today. And I, I, I want you to know Jesus and know who he is and know what he said about you and know the cost that he paid for you on the cross. And what he said on that cross is the most valuable thing I have, the most valuable thing in all of eternity is going to be paid for you so that you could be set free. Because until you're set free that way, you will not be free physically. You, you, can, you can have everything. I've seen it. I've seen it over and over again. You can have all the freedom you want. You can travel as much as you want, have all the money, have all the relationships you want. You can have every physical desire that you long for satisfied. And then you can still end up in depression. You can have the bed, but not be able to sleep. You can have the food, but not have the hunger to eat it. You can have all the physical needs met. But if you don't know Jesus, there's something that's missing. And I want you to meet him today. I want you to know that there's a God who loves you and is on your side. And he's setting you free. So that there, there's something I found out as I watched my, my grandfather deteriorate in his health. And he was a pastor, an amazing man of God. And I saw that struggle of deteriorating in health. And I... I said, I said to myself, I, I want to have the same belief and power within me when I'm in the nursing home as I did at the prime of my health because I believe in who God is and what he said about me more than I believe what my physical circumstances say about me. And that only happens through what's done on the cross for your sins and your guilt and your shame. So if that's you, I'd love, we, we've said this already, conversations matter. I'd love to have a conversation. Maybe you still have questions. You're like, ah, I want to follow Jesus, but I don't know about this. Or I, I'm really curious about that. I would love to have a conversation with you about you being set free spiritually and you coming to know the God who paid his son on the cross for your sins so that he could come to know you. I'd love to introduce him to you. And if that's you, at the end of today's experience, people are going to go out and do their thing. Just meet me up at the front. I'm just going to hang out up here and we'd love to talk. Uh, also, these gentlemen have volunteered their time as well to hang out with me to talk. If you have questions about any of the things we talked about, specific questions about their roles in fighting for freedom, what they do, or just want to get to know them, you can come to the front as well, hang out with them, get to know them. They'd love to talk to you and answer any questions. Um, can we get out one more time for those guys giving their time? <laughs>